I'm Pat Gunn, and this is a philosophy video. In this video, we're going to work on our way uh, from somewhere near solipsism up to a fully functional worldview. Now, before we get started on that path, we should probably define solipsism. Solipsism is the position that we don't really know that anything exists apart from us and that all of external reality might be a lie. <coughs> Now, it usually sits on the idea of something uh, similar to Descartes' uh, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. I actually reject this as a watertight idea. I don't think that we actually can conclude from the observation that we seem to be thinking to the idea that we exist. Now, partly that comes down to what does it mean to exist? And my idea of existence admits for the possibility of some edge cases uh, that would uh, would indicate that that uh, that things that don't exist could think. And why is that? I see thought, I see intelligence as being a pattern over data, the data being a set of brain states and the pattern being uh, uh, over time what, uh, what the patterns are in, uh, in the structure of the brain. Well, structure is not quite the right word, in the electrochemical uh, signaling of the brain. <coughs> so theoretically I think that we could have signaling that's like that on some type, uh, on some other kind of physical substrate or conceivably just over abstract data. I mean, if you can reduce it to numbers, uh, we could say that <clears throat> it doesn't really matter whether it's instantiated uh, right now or not. Uh, if you were to take a, uh, take a set of uh, transitions and data that would be intelligent, you could uh, compute the entire lifetime of an individual, the entire set of brain states, uh, the uh, entire set of communications between, uh, between neurons and their brain that they would go through over a lifetime. You could compute them all in an instant if you had enough computational power, or you could compute, uh, I mean, you could compute them all at once, you could compute them over millennia, millions of years, um, you could you could compute them conceivably in different uh, time directions or compute them not all in a sequence. The point is they would never their relationship to any physical object, any apparent physical object anyhow, could be quite abstract. So does that mean that the intelligence exists or not? I think we've with this thought experiment showed that at least we can't rely on cogito, uh, on cogito ergo sum. And so the idea that solipsism is this type of reliable root of philosophy is broken. That, uh, that doesn't mean that's not an interesting position. Uh, and uh, certainly, if, unless we're keen to go off into that world of thought experiments, um, then cogito ergo sum and solipsism seems like an interesting route uh, for us to begin growing, uh, growing our philosophy. Because we could imagine that perhaps we're, we're brains in a fat, or as Descartes thought, perhaps, uh, perhaps there are, uh, there's uh, a god that's evil that's feeding us lies continually. Uh, and Descartes kind of wondered if could we actually if we're pushed down by doubt uh, towards solipsism could we actually begin to build up uh, build up knowledge just based on the fact of cogito ergo sum now I think even though this solipsist position is only somewhat to moderately wrong in the sense that it's not as stable as people think it is uh, Descartes' later steps to reconstruct knowledge seem pretty broken. He 
he was working on this philosophical foundation that a lot of philosophers work from where they see the lack of complete uh, solidity in in uh, our philosophical roots and they see that as a problem they they're trying to build absolute knowledge and so digging down to those roots and then attempting to build a chain of reasoning that gives them a solid foundation it's very appealing I reject it as a method because I don't think any solid roots are possible um, and so we have to make do with um, well with with less solid roots with pragmatic roots and the reason that I think this is true is is that uh, basically any notion of solid roots that we've ever been exposed to philosophically we can tear them apart without too much effort uh, at least if we're really doing philosophy honestly we can tear them apart and given how long that we've had to play with these concepts and how much imagination we're able to apply to them it's not like we can prove that there are no possible uh, roots of that sort but that's we've had so long to look for them and we haven't found them yet pragmatically we should probably conclude that there aren't such roots but it remains a theoretically open problem that some philosophers will continue to throw themselves at and will have to apply as much cynicism as we can and see if anything survives uh, survives that I don't think anything ever will, but maybe. And uh, it's always nice to, to have at least some, some level of freedom of motion in philosophy, to have some unsolved problems, or at least some problems that we never quite completely solve. And maybe people will dig down into that uncertainty and launch off in a direction that nobody's launched uh, from before. So. In order to, to start building from uh, from either absolute uncertainty or from solipsism, we need to make pragmatic moves. And what that means is that we're taking the risk of being wrong at, at every step we make. And we hope not to be uh, making a big risk, uh, not taking gigantic risks along the way, but we, we, we ideally should be able to recognize that, that the steps we're taking are not watertight and to consider that okay. So what do we lose when we move away from solipsism? We lose some of the brain in a vat. Uh, some of the... We, we lose touch with the possibility that we might be brains in a vat. And... And so what this gives us is it, it gives us the idea of apparent reality that we're going to treat for all intents and purposes as reality. And that's okay. Whatever the rules that we find out in science, even if it's all part of a simulated environment, even if the rules, uh, that, uh, rules of physics that we seem to be learning or chemistry or any of the other topics of science, even if they turn out not to be describing some uh, some different reality that's emulating this one, we're still left with uh, apparent reality, and it's still useful to learn its rules. It's still fascinating. I don't think we actually lose anything in in considering that perhaps uh, we're just exploring an apparent reality uh, r rather than some deeper reality. And we could have the idea of even nested realities. Maybe, um, maybe one universe is simulating another, which is simulating another. There are, there are all sorts of possibilities. I'm sorry, one of my cats is misbehaving. Um, and uh, or maybe there's even a, a weirder set of chains there, but we can deal with it. And ideally, even if we ever find out that we're just uh, we are living in a simulated reality, it wouldn't impact our our daily lives very much. 
or at least it, it probably wouldn't uh, for people with perspectives like mine it just wouldn't matter but I've occasionally spoken with people who have an emotional attachment to the idea of living in the real reality whatever that would mean and I wonder if they're missing something in the sense that we don't really understand the root of of our physics and one of the, the one of the points that I uh, I generally make with artificial intelligence is that there isn't a principal distinction between emulating something and implementing something and that if you see the patterns as being what's significant, patterns of data, uh, patter uh, patterns of, uh, of information, then a simulation and an implementation actually move data around in the same way. And so it just comes down to whatever term you prefer bet between those. Now that isn't a guarantee that if there were another reality that's deeper than uh, than this one, that uh, in which this one is being implemented, maybe there there are apparent philosophical rules in that one that are intrinsic to the nature of things and that are apparent. We just wouldn't know because we don't have access to that. But whatever it is, because we don't ha have access to it, we might as well not worry about it. It's uh, and you'll 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 get the strain of pragmatism as we step further up the chain. So we content ourselves with exploring apparent reality, and practically speaking, we treat it uh, as reality. Um, and we don't really feel that we've lost a lot because it it probably shouldn't matter, or at least if you think it matters. It's up to you to provide an argument uh, as to why it matters, which I, I often am, am wary of those claims, but uh, of claims of that style, because it smacks of I've declared myself in a default position, and you're the one who has to uh, has to pull us away from where I've planted uh, the flag. But in this case, it's it's not that I don't understand, uh, or it's not that I. It's not that I, I'm claiming privilege so much as uh, I don't understand how that uh, how, what such an argument would would, uh, would look like, and I'm willing to consider it on equal standing if somebody can present it in a compelling way. Uh, but nobody has done that yet, and I've looked over a lot of arguments on, on the topic and I've never really seen much coherence from the anti-virtualization view. So we have an apparent reality and we're exposed to that reality through what seem to be our senses. And our senses, at least intuitively, we, we would like to think of them as accurately representing reality. And maybe even the concepts that we build to model reality, we, we would like to think that they have the deepest possible meaning. But as we go through existence, we see that they tilt against themselves. Uh, things like optical illusions, things like concepts that are only kind of right. And so we're invited when we consider such complexities to loosen our grip on language, to loosen our grip on, on even logic, and to be very pragmatic. And the reason that we're in, inclined to do this is that every time we're forced to choose between logic and something that we observe, or our senses and uh, in greater consistencies, like if you show me an optical illusion that appears to have, uh, or that's printed on a paper that appears to have depth, and I reach my hand uh, out and touch it, and my hand doesn't go into whatever I'm viewing, if I'm looking at art, uh, or if I'm just trying to parse uh, something that somebody's drawn that 
uh, like an Escher drawing that doesn't seem to be internally consistent, but a lot of my brain hardware is wired to, to think because it's so compelling, uh, compellingly presented that it's possible. And I trace through it and trace through it and it just doesn't make sense. We learn to potentially mistrust our senses. And this is a weird thing to do because our senses are the gateway through which we see the entire rest of the universe. And we, we need to be willing to not exactly, we don't find alternatives to our senses, but rather we learn about particular flaws in them. And, uh, and we aim for models of consistency of the universe that allow us to doubt the immediate truth of the things that we see, we hear. And to a certain extent, if, we get, if we're lucky enough to, to have the right kind of training, we even doubt our minds to a certain extent. And what I mean when I say this is that if you study psychology, uh, if you, particularly if you study cognitive psychology, you'll see all sorts of fascinating experiments that will make you doubt your memory. It'll make you doubt memories in general. It'll make you doubt, um, doubt your, that your attention is as good as you uh, think it is. And this is a very jarring thing to learn because we, our brains appear to be wired to believe in a continuity and a solidity of our perceptions that, uh, that isn't borne out by the facts. You could ask somebody after one of these experiments what they saw, what they remember, and usually they'll, they'll tell you a story, and they'll tell you a story that's internally consistent, but the story if you then represent the facts to them and ask them, uh, ask them to verify how well their story matches up with it, they'll be stunned. Oftentimes they'll accuse you of changing the data. But if, if you study it, you'll do this to yourself. And eventually that, that phenomenon that we're hardwired to believe on some instinctual level it'll start to, to fall off. You'll start to, to see that your perceptions are twisted. Twisted is not, well, it's sometimes the right word, but you'll, you'll, you'll see that a lot of the way that memory works is that we're telling stories based on fragments of memory rather than having solid video camera-like memories of things. And that if you were to describe a memory in precise detail, something that you really think you solidly remember, and if you're asked for details like, what's the hair color of this person, or what are they wearing, and you might, you might actually feel that you remember that. And then you do it a month later, and you're asked for those details. And you might be just as sure that you're remembering it accurately, but you'll give different details. Or if you're asked, uh, if, if the event was recorded on video uh, camera and then you ask someone to report it and you, uh, you, you video edit the real event to change the color of something to match their memory uh, and show them the video, they'll think, yeah, that's really what was there. And then you show them the original uh, video and they'll insist that it's wrong. It's, it's perfectly normal. We, we all do this to, uh, to a certain extent. It's part of how our cognition works. But it's not as solid as we think it is. And, and this is just one of the lessons you learn from studying cognitive psychology. And, and it doesn't mean that we draw away from our senses. It doesn't mean that we're going to decide, well, I'll never try and remember anything again because these things are not solid. It just means that we develop a kind of cognitive humility. Uh, we recognize that humans are 
uh, our brains are not perfect and that nothing that we think is solid is quite as solid as we think it is. And, uh, and oftentimes we might develop technologies that help us more accurately sense, more accurately record, uh, more accurately summarize. And, uh, and these things act as cognitive aids. I mean, it's not the first cognitive aid. The, when we develop writing, we gain the ability to, uh, uh, we gain, it's not really that we gain the ability, we lost the ability, the, the unfortunate ability to rewrite history in our heads because we have external aids to help us remember things, help us store our thoughts in ways that they're not going to slip away from us or we're not going to change our memories to, uh, to make it easier to emotionally deal with things. Diaries are powerful things and, uh, and they, they change the way uh, with which we interact with the world and maybe in the future we'll have all sorts of new technologies that will be with us all the time. Uh, some people are wearing devices now that will take a picture of wherever they are every 10 seconds and store it on some kind of internal storage. Uh, they are kind of weird people, but uh, they're people. And uh, no doubt it changes the way that they remember the past. It gives them a, a more accurate perception. It stops them from lying to themselves quite as much. Uh, but so what this, what this means is that we develop ways to ways to think about our raw sensory data, about our thoughts, uh, and uh, we develop aids to help them be more accurate. Uh, and you know, as I said, we don't get independence from our senses or our memory or things like that, but we, we find ways to improve them. And we find ways to doubt them in their natural form. And that's healthy. Now, there's, there remains the question of what about abstract things? Because if we, if we decide that truth is, uh, is uh, correspondence to reality, and that's the general uh, view of truth that, that I use, or at least correspondence to apparent reality based on our current frameworks of reality, then what about things, uh, what about truth claims that don't appear to be part of reality, like claims about what is right. How would you measure uh, the, the veracity of a claim that something is wrong, uh, or, or morally wrong, or ethically wrong, or, or even a mathematical claim, like uh, 2 plus 2 equals 4, or 5, or 6? How do we evaluate those things? Are they, uh, are they potentially true? And what I would claim is, uh, is that when it comes to morality, they're not potentially true or false because they don't describe physical reality. I prefer to reserve the term true for correspondence to, uh, to physical reality. And I might use the term metaphorically in other domains, but, uh, but, but it's not it's not the same thing as the main concept of truth that I use. Uh, and so for claims about morality and values, I actually would prefer that, w that we use a different terminology. Instead of saying, I think this is true, I would say, I hold this. So the, the unified terminology that I think that we probably shouldn't be using between values uh, uh, value statements and truths is somebody says it's true that jaywalking is wrong. Instead I would suggest I hold that jaywalking is wrong. And it gets rid of that hint of absolutism, the hint that we're actually describing something that's true or false. And instead we're talking about values and value conclusions that we hold. Now practically speaking I don't live in that linguistic world and neither does most of society. 
I try to do it when I'm talking philosophy and when I'm being very careful, uh, but I don't do so consistently, and particularly when I'm talking with people casually, not using philosophy. Sometimes I slip into the what I consider to be sloppy uh, bridging of the two realms, but completely properly, I think that we shouldn't be using the same terms. Now, when it comes to, to mathematics, I don't think that anything in mathematics is potentially true or false, at least not in, in the term, uh, not in my general term, true or false. Now, mathematics is a set of systems that aim to be self-consistent, meaning that if you accept their axioms, theoretically there are, uh, there are claims that are built on the axioms that, um, that are consistent with the axioms, in which case they're traditionally called true, or they're inconsistent with the axioms, in which case they're traditionally called false. I would prefer that, that we use the terms uh, axiom consistent and axiom non-consistent, but I accept as a metaphor uh, or alternat uh, alternatively as a domain-specific term true or false uh, in the traditional mathematical senses, but I don't accept that they're more true than anything in, uh, in reality. It's rather that I feel that I'm not using the term quite right and that mathematicians are not, are not being as careful as they can, either that or they're deciding to work within the traditional metaphor of math, and that's fine. But I think <coughs> that the actual, uh, so when I say correspondence with apparent reality, what I mean by that is that it's not that we have direct access to apparent reality, whether it's reality or not, is is unimportant, but even as apparent reality, we don't have direct access to it. It's mediated by our senses, it's mediated by our biology, it's mediated by, by our uh, mental capacity and our mental style. <clears throat> and all we really can know is that we have a we have an intelligence that appears to be able to work with the world in a certain way, to observe its consistencies and to build frameworks that take advantage of that. Uh, we look at the consistencies, we build our theories, we build devices that are built based on those theories. Now that's no guarantee that the theories have any kind of necessary deep tie into reality. In fact, I generally don't think that they conceivably could, but they're pragmatically useful. And so we, uh, we use them. We use the terms, even though the universe probably doesn't care about our use of language. We use the terms, even, uh, we have the concepts, even though we don't think that the universe itself uh, is based on con concepts like ours. Whatever it is, it's unreachable. We, we can't touch it ex uh, except to the extent that, uh, that our theories appear to have, um, appear to be testable uh, to a certain extent, that we can build devices that, that exploit seeming consistency in apparent reality. And, uh, and you'll note that I'm being very careful here, uh, in not, not necessarily in the virtuous kind of, of way, but rather I'm being conservative in how, I'm, uh, how willing I am to step from, from empiricism to any deeper metaphysical claims. And that's because I, I think that our arguments are strongest when they're close to empiricism and that there's so much variety outside of empiricism that we would be unwise to step out in, into that jungle without a clear compass, at least, or at least to pretend that we're solidly doing so. And so it's, it's a type of wariness of getting lost when we don't really need to leave 
uh, empirical grounds um, that keeps me close to empiricism. And I, and I consider this radical empiricism in the sense that we, A, we might not be dealing with real reality and it's appropriate to keep some level of doubt down to the solipsistic level and maybe down even beyond it. And, uh, to, and, to, and to be comfortable with that. But, but also, being wary of stepping beyond it means that we don't have to deal with all the complicated stuff that comes with, are we, do we actually believe that logic is solid? We don't need to believe that. We don't need to get into any of those questions. We might not even decide that they're interesting or important. We might decide that they just don't matter because logic, we, we can see how we built it through trial and error. We, we try and find out which axioms we need to build useful, self-consistent systems. And, and we call those logics. And we could have more than one system of logic. Uh, we don't need to believe that the universe cares about our logic. We don't believe, need to believe that we can compel the universe into doing things or even prove things possible or impossible with logic. All we need for our logic to be useful is precisely, uh, is precisely that it helps us organize our thoughts and it helps us uh, organize our observations. And so I'm unwilling to step beyond that. I'm un, uh, I might be willing to speculate as to as to whether these things are more deeply true, but I don't see any evidence that they are. And it seems like just one of many possible ways of looking at the universe. And it seems to me an unnecessary complication that we should think that the universe is logical. So I, I'm willing to go this far into the, meta, uh, in, into the meta philosophy of logic. I generally am not interested in, in moving beyond because, uh, because logic is just not a particular interest of mine. And I think that we're, we're digging into areas where there's no benefit. Um, and uh, well, not that there, not that logic is useless, but rather that taking a stance on the truth of logic is done without evidence, and it doesn't help the functional ideas of logic. And as an unrooted experience philosophically, I don't see why why we would want to to step into it. And I, I see every reason to doubt that we've that any particular reasoning uh, about some type of deeper met, uh, metaphysical tie between logic and the nature of the universe itself is mistaken based on the idea that brains as a physical uh, as a physical construct created, created this logic I think that eventually we'll be able to trace through how the brains do that and that would kind of disqualify them from any deeper uh, tie into the nature of things. And admittedly, I, uh, in order to really show what I'm getting at with that argument, I, I'd have to go into a fairly long discussion of computational theory and, uh, and intuitions about the nature of things. Maybe I'll do that in a later video. Uh, not right now. <clears throat> So, this is why I don't think that we need mathematics to be true. It's why I, I don't think that we, uh, we should consider values, uh, value statements uh, to be true on some deeper level. And it, it, it even gets into the, into the question, what would it mean for a mathematical statement to be true or for a value statement to be true? Uh, and I don't think it would actually mean anything, at least based on the way that I, uh, I talk about truth. So, what we're, what we're left with at this point is a pragmatic, empirically based uh, system 
a system that's where we where we build our truth claims, where we test them based on uh, continued um, observation of things as an individual, and and having recognized that there are a number of faults that keep our senses from being right and, and potentially keep our uh, or at least being reliable and that keep our thinking from necessarily being reliable we develop personal and social ways to deal with those shortcomings but when we're attempting to discern the apparent ideas about how nature works we build social structures and we build methods that help us approach the various topics in existence and originally I think uh, and originally and on some deeper level I think philosophy is the general domain of thought it covers all areas of human thought and uh, and so everything is within its domain but we ended up uh, we end up coordinating off uh, sectors of uh, topical sectors of human thought and we give them to sciences when they're uh, when they're uh, empirical as, uh, as topics uh, that is they're talking about physical reality and when they develop the uh, the intellectual traditions that let them uh, that generally are specific to that field uh, and when they develop methods that are specific uh, to that field that let them pursue truth in a more uh, pursue more convergent truths and I covered the idea of convergence and divergence in an earlier video then then broad philosophy allows them to like take for example physics originally physics was part of philosophy uh, you had this idea of natural philosophy philosophy about the natural world and this was the immediate predecessor to many scientific fields and it started to develop, uh, to develop general methods for approaching natural philosophy and then you end, uh, ended up having all these fields that split off from it that developed their own methods specific to whatever they were talking about physics uh, got one and then physics eventually split off into a number of different fields chemistry psychology although psychology is kind of a complex field uh, field because it's actually more of a set of fields than a single field but each of these disciplines developed its own traditions developed its own research methods and they most of them started with the scientific method or in the case of history you end up having historical methods uh, methods that are skeptical methods that attempt to correct for just the idea of having somebody claim expertise and say this is truth you have the idea of people doing experiments people doing publications other people criticizing those publications and over time as those fields uh, keep working on these problems they they get better and better at cutting out uh, yeah, sorry I have a cat that's being very friendly because she's kinda hungry uh, because I'm at a cat food right now, um, but they uh, they diverge from from the broader discourse-centric methods of philosophy, and they diverge from undifferen uh, undifferentiated science to communities of their own that have decided what methods are acceptable and what styles of argument are appropriate, what statistical means and levels are the right uh, for their discipline. And then, and then we call them a science and we generally call them a distinct science and they might s split off into several sub-sciences eventually um, and it's not that they've really left the domain of philosophy or at least what I call big P philosophy which still includes all of uh, which still is the general domain of thought but um, but we never considered big P philosophy the only term philosophy worth talking about there, there are there is the small p philosophy philosophy that's explicitly concerned with questions that don't have 
uh, convergent answers. Uh, the small p philosophy is explicitly divergent as a topic, and it uses um, it uses the general discourse centric methods for all of its questions, and it probably will for the foreseeable future. Questions about what is right, what is the good life, what is morality, what should we believe? And none of these questions have scientific answers. They never will. And uh, we accept that. And it just means that we're going to argue and we're going to keep on arguing as a way to weed out the bad arguments and the weak perspectives. And as, as a divergent field, small p philosophy will never reach one answer for all of these questions. But it will cut out the bad answers, th those that are not arguable well, those that are internally inconsistent, those that are too alien from, uh, from the life needs of humans. So we'll be left with, probably for most of these questions, many decent answers. And that's fine. But we, we do see the small p philosophy that I just described as being a realm that's distinct from science or history. Uh, basically because it's not typically empirical. It, it's not that, uh, that small p philosophy can't I guess I, would, I wouldn't say that it's informed by science, but rather you need to mix, uh, when it comes to morality, you need to mix facts that are uh, typically specific to a situation with the value statements that you've constructed in order to know what your action, uh, action should be. And some people say that's science-informing philosophy. Uh, but I would rather claim that you need to have contributions from both sides in order to determine a course of action. Uh, and so it's more of an equal mix from, well, equal is not the right word. You need a mix from two completely different domains that hook together to, uh, to create, um, to create the, the pragma. Uh, and I'm not meaning the term pragma as the specific term as I've used it in my general philosophy, but rather in the sense of uh, in order to create action, uh, in order to justify action, you need components from both domains. And so this leaves us with a relatively, relatively complete, if not filled in, metaphysical framework. We have empiricism and we have science that get us uh, an apparent world, that get us knowledge about the apparent world. We have the, the daily empiricism that we all use to understand uh, our lives that's not as powerful, that's faulty. And we have our senses, which are also faulty, but we learn to, uh, to correct for their faults, uh, to navigate apparent reality. And we have a universe where our thoughts are probably not first-class entities, um, where we can't argue with the universe, where words don't, word, where the words and terms that we use don't have an absolute meaning, but rather they have a meaning that we assign to them, and we constructed them pragmatically because they were useful. Uh, I mean, I'm being redundant here, but most of our philosophy has pragmatic roots. Or, um, or maybe all of our philosophy has prag pragmatic roots. And we'll never have that certainty or absolutism that maybe we might crave, or maybe we once craved as children. And we accept that. Uh, and we, we then have this perspective of morality that it's not about truth. Uh, but there are ways that we judge it. We judge it by the meaning that it gives our, li uh, our lives, the behavior that it uh, engenders, its philosophical self-consistency, how well it meshes with our other ideas about what philosophy should be. Um, we develop our own uh, fully 
complex sets of criteria for how we judge value statements, and um, and and that's enough. Now, conceivably, we might decide to put a lot more layers in there, like or or at least we might decide to delve into the specific uh, the specifics of how much we trust our senses. Um, how do we get around uh, the idea that our senses are faulty when we still need to rely on them? Interesting questions. Um, but I don't think that these are necessarily hard questions, even if the details are potentially very interesting. Um, and there, there probably are people who love playing with words uh, or who love logic puzzles who would like to prove well, we must rely on our senses because how could you possibly, uh, um, how could you possibly build something up on an unstable base? Or at least that's what their argument would amount to. And I would just say, how could uh, how uh, how could we possibly not build it on an unstable base, given that that's all we apparently have? And so often they'll they'll do wordplay and dig around and in metaphysics and uh, in an attempt to actually build that solid ground but it's not there or at least if it is there nobody's found it yet in thousands of years of philosophy so you'll notice throughout this that I haven't gotten into the idea of gods uh, and I'll cover that more in a later video but I, I guess at this point I'll say they, we haven't seen evidence uh, of gods, or at least no evidence that really stands the cog uh, stands by the the cognitive faults that we've observed in our species, and and so that gives us a, a good reason to initially doubt that there are gods. It, but it isn't yet an iron ironclad case, or even a particularly strong argument that there aren't any, which isn't to say that I, I don't think that there are decent arguments that there are, uh, aren't any gods. There are pragmatic arguments, mind you, not solid ironclad arguments, although I'll generally claim that the ironclad arguments that we're talking about don't exist for any topic, even beyond uh, or to solipsism. Uh, but but yeah, we'll, we'll copy uh, or we'll cover that more in a uh, in a later video. But th I hope I this has been a reasonably coherent step uh, set of steps from solipsism up to the the foundation for a relatively full modern worldview, even if it doesn't provide the specifics. Um, I might uh, I might also at some point. Uh, get into the details of my specifics, although I suspect uh, my, my viewers will already have theirs and already have their own philosophical views, so I'm not sure if it would be that interesting to get into, into, the, uh, into the details of mine. But one of the things I've learned in philosophical conversations is that you don't always know what people have devoted time to. And so there are plenty of, of things that might seem perfectly obvious to you, but unless you've had a lot of conversations with a great variety of people, maybe what seems really obvious to you isn't obvious to other people, or maybe you'll find surprisingly interesting differences between people in a realm where you really only thought one or a few possibilities were there. Um, so... Uh, I mean, I guess with, with videos like these, I, I never really know what's what's obvious. Uh, but I suspect that that's culturally and personally specific. And so, uh, in any case, I'd be happy just with, uh, with all of my videos for a certain amount of time to uh, go over uh, or to converse about the, um, about the specifics of any part of it in the comments section of this video. At some point, I'll probably move on and stop looking for uh, comments here or potentially get bored of, of responding to this, but at least for a while. Uh, keep it civil, and uh, I'd be happy to have that conversation with you. So that gets us to the end of this video. 
So take care and I'll see you in the next video.